welcome Cicero community, Cicero students, uh, maybe some parents, guardians, I'm not sure uh, who we'll, we'll have joining us. My name is Michael Alex, and uh, I am one of the uh, Cicero teachers, and I'm happy to be here uh, with Paul Bennett and with some other students uh, to uh, talk about tomorrow skills um, and to set up what uh, our intention is to set up a uh, three-part series talking about the skills that, um, I, I mean, I, I think the framing would be young people, but really all people um, need for tomorrow, today. Um, so uh, I am coming to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, uh, and maybe we could just go uh, around the circle with the people that are here live and you could introduce yourself and uh, share a little bit about wh uh, maybe where you are and if there's Anything noteworthy that's been happening in your part of the world today? Uh, Ness, can I actually, is it okay? Can I call on you? Do you, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. My name is Ness. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, California. And a school is happening, like, outside in our backyard. There's school happening in the, in the backyard? Nice. All right. Learn in the, in the backyard. What, what's happening out in school in the backyard? Um. We have this like homeschool group with my sister that's younger, yep. and then they like work full time together with this teacher named Joe. Fantastic! Well, welcome, Ness. Thanks. And the Bennetts. Hi, um, I'm a student. Actually, I'm not um, part of the teaching at Cicero. I'm Jade. Um, we're in the same place. We're in Grenada, in the Caribbean, and um, I don't know. I think. Anything notable happening? Oh, we've right now is oh. this hurricane that's kind of sweeping around us at the moment. It's not hitting. Yep, us. you're back. Sorry, we have okay. um, yeah, we we've had this hurricane that's sweeping around us. It's not um, it's not hitting us right now, but we're getting the very edges of it. So we've had a lot of rain today. Wow. Okay. I can only, uh, when I think about, uh, day-to-day -day classroom stresses, hurricane is not typically, uh, <laughs> on the list. So there you go. I, I, I should share, I won't, we, we'll get started with the session, but I, uh, I had the, uh, opportunity today to, um, interview in a session like this, Canada's, um, uh, first and top ranked, uh, black Naval commander, um, who shared a story about losing power at sea in the Caribbean, um and swells and just oh my gosh i was like my heart was pounding just hearing it so glad that you're safe um and wanted to, to send a shout out uh, to um many of you who i i understand will be joining us asynchronously which again is one of the beauties of virtual learning is that we can fit um the learning into our our lives and our schedules and so i uh, you know recognize that we have people coming to us from asia and from europe and and what have you and um, certainly welcome to you as well, um, if you're taking this in by recording. Um, I am going to have prepared a, a, a short slide deck just to set up the session and really just to give you um, a sense at the outset, um, I, would, I would say two things. One is for, for Jaden and Ness, because you're here live, if you have any uh, contributions, if you have any questions, if you have any ideas as we go through, um, please share them. Um, and, and that's a two-parter. For those of you who are uh, joining us via recording, um, I will, uh, and, and certainly Cicero uh, can, can share my contact information. And if there's anything following your viewing of the session um, that you wanted to send my way by way of questions or uh, comments or just ideas that you have, you can absolutely email me and uh, there will be a slight uh, lag in, in that we're not face-to-face but I'll absolutely get back to you, okay? Um, all right, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. Bear with me for half a second. Hey, Michael, just one quick comment. Please. Um, you know, one place that students could post questions for you is in the Slack, right? So we have a, a shared channel for students and teachers where they can communicate with one another, and that would be a I think a brilliant place for students to post questions and then hear your answers because everybody, teachers and students would be able to kind of see that. 
I think, thank you, Paul. And, and actually to the extent that, um, um, there we go. I'm sorry. I'm just starting the presentation there properly in the background. Um, yeah. And to the extent that if I'm, if I, I'm, um, omitting something like that, that makes sense and Slack absolutely does. Um, then yeah, that, that would be great. Um, I, uh, I must say I work uh, a little bit of personal context here. So one of my, uh, part of my portfolio is working for an educational nonprofit and I have the, um, the great good pleasure of working in a multi-generational multi work group, which is to say, we have a small cadre of baby boomers. There is, uh, I am the lone, no, actually there's one other Gen Xer. We've got a couple of millennials and then several Gen Z or Gen Z, is it Gen Z in America? But in any case, uh, or Gen Z in America, Gen Z up here. In any case, um, it's been really interesting working both virtually and in person across generations and really just understanding some of the assumptions and mindsets that inform how we we think and learn and work. Um, because I think that there are um, generational differences and aptitudes, um, but really here when we're talking about these sorts of skills, um, we benefit whatever the age would be, truthfully. Um, and Slack is a good example. That's sorry, there's there's where I started with that. Um, I am a recent convert uh, to Slack. I think it's probably the best uh, platform out there as far as um, what we can do to communicate. So yes, as Paul says, please do reach out to me on Slack and I'll get back to you. Yes. Wait, so in the meeting, I should, should I reach out to you on Slack or just after? Uh, it's a great question. No, during the meeting, you can you, we can just talk, right? Um, there will be a couple of things now, and I was expecting um, that or anticipating that we might have a, a few more people with us here live. So I think I'm going to just kind of roll with the punches and switch up the activities. I had a few things planned where we, we might get into breakouts or using the chat function, but I think it probably makes sense just to have a conversation. So you and you and Jade and certainly Paul can, can certainly speak up at any point. Cool? Yeah, thanks. Right on. Okay. So let's get started here. And I'm just going to flip the slide. Okay. So let's just stop and actually set aside the rest of the day. So one thing that I have um, noticed personally in my practice of teaching in this way, working with uh, students through Cicero, is that Often in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, um, you're sort of coming to, to a class and you know hoping to hit the ground running, but it really, I think, serves us well to set a sort of boundary, a little boundary on either side and say, okay, whatever's come before today, we're just gonna leave it there. Whatever's coming after, don't need to worry about it. The time that we've got together is dedicated to focusing up on uh, what we're about today. And really, today's session, first and foremost, is about supporting you, the students, um, to get the skills and aptitudes and practice them, um, set them up as routines and habits so that you uh, have all the advantages uh, at your disposal for learning, working, and thriving in, in, the, in the coming century. So I wanted to start off, actually, um, with this question, which is, what do you find challenging about learning virtually. And I'm actually going to make, I'm going to uh, come out of the slide for a moment and add a, a part two that's not there in the text. It's not just challenging. We're obviously doing this because there are huge benefits. So you might also think about what are the benefits of learning this way? Let's start there. What do we, Maybe just taking a moment and thinking about the, the positive, the pros. What are the benefits that you find from your perspective and your experience in learning this way? Take a moment and just reflect on that. And then if there's something that you'd maybe like to share with the group, and I will as well. Okay. And if you are working asynchronously, I saw uh, a parent daughter look there. That's great. Um, uh, so if you're, and also if you're, if you are working asynchronously, this, I, I'm throwing that challenge to you as well. Okay. So what is it that you really love about um, this style of, of learning? Either of you like to start us off? Sure. I can definitely yeah. jump in. Great. Thanks, um, Yeah. I think uh, the main benefit is something you already said of 
the kind of the value that our time together as a student and the teacher has. Um, it's something that's so important. And every time I have a class, you know, even if I'm meeting with a teacher just once a week and I interact with them, you know, barely through emails and sometimes through Slack, but, you know, very minimally, even if we just have an hour together a week, it makes that hour very special and something that we cherish. And the, the things we talk about there are very like intellectual and we're really trying to push each other because we know we only have that amount of time. Um, so I think that's definitely getting to like, you know, have, having this amount of time and the value of it is, mm -hmm. is definitely magnified. Awesome, thank you. That's a great point. Uh, Ness, how about you? Um, this is benefits of learning virtually. Yes, sir. Um, that people from all over the world can meet together, even it's not in person, but at least we can all meet together when we wish, when we usually wouldn't be able to. Right on, excellent. Um, that is also that's great contribution. Yeah, for me, I would say the fact that those meetings that you're talking about can happen anywhere. So you know, today I'm at home. Sometimes I'm on a university campus. I might be in a coffee shop. I, I you know I can do it traveling. It's fantastic. What are the challenges now, perhaps, that we've faced? And here, I, you know, we might pause and just reflect for a moment. I think that the, you know, the world as, as a whole really sort of made the jump into this style of learning, certainly distance learning. I, I'm a distance educator going back 20 years, but I'm old enough to remember a time when I would hand students literally a sheaf of paper stapled and say, here's your package to go, talk to you in a month. And, and that was truly it. There was no Slack, there were no virtual meetings. Um, so we've all come a long way in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, that being said, there are aspects of any uh, form of learning or any uh, uh, form of using our time in this way that are gonna be challenging. So any that, that might jump out, at, at, jump out for you at this point, for either of you. or they might be historical. These might be skills that you've mastered. I'm thinking of you here, Jade. These might be things that initially were a challenge, but you've had a little bit of practice and have picked up some, some pointers and tips. Yeah, I think definitely um, just managing, you know, being a student is very different through CISO or through virtually um, than, than being a student in a regular school um, with many peers and many other teachers. Um, definitely, you know, learning how to manage yourself and how to understand your time and your your workload. Um, I've had many years to um, hone that and to understand that. But in the beginning, it was definitely very hard to try to figure out how I was going to do this on my own, where I have mm -hmm. a lot of support. But you know, you're you're the main proponent of this, and you're the person who's figuring this out. So that's definitely difficult. Yeah, I totally hear that. I mean, you are the ones driving the bus, right? Like very much so. Yeah, excellent point. Nas, anything that, that, and it's totally okay if not, but anything that jumps out for you? Um, it's not exactly that we're in the same place, so we can't see exactly what you see. Mm. You have to like figure out how to like share the screen, raise hand, find all the tabs. So that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. So yeah, te technological challenges for sure. Um, I know that on a personal level, um, one of the challenges I have is that I like to use one device as my camera and then have my, and that typically is a tablet, and then I've got my uh, computer so that it can be working simultaneously, which then has presented a challenge around doing things like sharing things on the screen. And so like, what's the workaround? Right. So and the, the Cicero students with whom I'm working, we we are basically in fact, we have we're going to be migrating to Slack because that that's come online recently. Um, our system has been uh, a sort of mashup of Google Meet and WhatsApp uh, for what it's worth. OK, well, I, I really want to um, suggest to you that as we we move through um, not just today, but the, the three sessions that as uh, some of these ideas are put forward to you or you, you know, upon reflection, you're thinking like, oh yeah, there is this thing. Certainly make note of that. And like I say, reach out via Slack and, and let me know. So um, in terms of, uh, I, I had mentioned that 
my background is in distance education. And so I have worked for the better part of 20 years with uh, people of your age who were traveling um, the country and in fact the world pursuing um, largely outside pursuits in athletics and the arts, so dance and, and um, uh, Olympic athletes and what have you, who were, you know, leading the sorts of interesting lives that so many Cicero students are. Um, so what I'm about to share with you on this next slide are, this is certainly not this is the short list, but what I would say, these are some of the key um, factors that I've observed and that I've heard, I've gotten feedback from students over the years, the, the challenges that they, they find in terms of virtual learning. Task completion for sure, and Jade, you had mentioned this a moment ago, um, simply, you know, because the material isn't perhaps being um, handed down with someone, you know, at the front of the room and the bell ringing and we're, uh, you know, there's follow up in that way, because you are driving your own education, um, there really needs, needs to be um, a whole host of skills around dealing with procrastination, um, prioritization, um, how to um, schedule your time, and how to actually, uh, these are, these are complementary but separate aspects. There's task completion, and then there's time management. Or as I, you know, I sometimes um, talk about this in the, in the uh, executive function course I teach at Cicero, there's getting things done, and then there's showing up. <laughs> and showing up prepared, right? And those two things obviously go together. Mm -hmm. um, so managing commitments being that second task. And so um, in subsequent sessions, we're going to talk about time blocking. We're going to talk about different hard copy and electronic strategies for managing your commitments. Communication is a big one. Um, and again, here, this is, uh, you know, from my perspective, this is something that kind of cuts both ways. We have so many tools at our disposal but how do we use them, right? Um, so how to write an effective email, um, a professional one, um, how to use platforms like Slack, uh, how to even here, and, and, and here I, I'm tipping my hand ab about my sort of philosophy as a teacher. I really believe strongly in people showing their learning, and that includes me. So when I don't know something, I say it loud and proud because that is an opportunity, that is when the learning begins, right? Um, you know, if I make a mistake, it's, it's not, oh man, there's something wrong with me. How could that happen? It's like, yes, that's a win. We've identified it. How do we actually do something about it? Um, and so when, you know, when it comes to communication, my own practice, uh, continues to evolve when it comes to email. Uh, I have, uh, in the past found it challenging, you know, I'm often, I'm writing away, writing away. And I realize I've written a short novel. Uh, when really, you know, that's not the purpose of email. Like it's it's a, a much smaller time window, um, perhaps bigger than a, a direct message, but you know, not a phone call. So we're going to talk about best practices and communication. How to set up a workflow, um, which again is going to encompass to some extent all of these things. Uh, I think we might touch down on how to be prepared for how to I, what I call it is mission control. What does your actual work area look like? What are the aspects of, of um, being prepared for class? Uh, you know, in, in my case, you wouldn't be able to see it, uh, but all around me, I have arrayed, you know, the various technologies, uh, but also self-care. So things like something to drink and opportunities for, um, for regular stretching and movement um, so that you aren't burnt out. I know that my first year of full time, so in year one of the pandemic, I was uh, I spent 10 months doing uh, three 75 minute classes a day in a public high school online. And it was great for the first six months. And I got to tell you, I was grinding pretty hard by those last few weeks. We all were simply because um, there hadn't been uh, an, a proper a proper appreciation for how to set up a workflow that, that is sustainable. And that's mm -hmm. what we want to do. The second aspect of that that we might think about if you haven't already is how do you take your workstation or your mission control on the road, which is to say, if you're going to be working in a place that isn't maybe your, your normal, how do you make sure that you're actually going to be set up and be able to do your best to show up at your best? So we'll speak to um, some of that perhaps as well. And I should say too here, very much I will will be directing, we, we certainly have an outline um, that 
uh, the team at Cicero, we've been talking about what to offer in these subsequent sessions, but we'll also be directed by your questions and comments. So really do keep the, the input coming via Slack. And we'll, some of these we may touch on very briefly and others will will really touch down. Ah, this is a big one and not just for virtual learning, but how to stay motivated. Um, uh, this one is a real, I like, I love this topic. It's so rich and deep. Um, when you inquire with people, how do you get things done? Often, even the most efficient, effective people have very little insight in my experience to what makes them successful. Like what makes them able to, to take care of business, so to speak. So we, you know, if that is a challenge, we can certainly talk about how to deal with motivation, deal with issues of procrastination. Interestingly, just that they just a touch there for a moment, procrastination is not almost ever about laziness. It's all uh, way more often about things like stress and perfectionism, okay, among other things. So we can touch, touch down there. On a related note, there is the issue of stress management, okay? Um, and particularly, you know, as, as uh, you said, Jade, earlier, you know, having to figure things out on your own and, and perhaps with a little bit less support, um, what happens when you perhaps don't have someone to talk about the challenges that you're facing in or outside of class? So this is a big part of, of uh, not just working with Cicero or learning with Cicero, but being able to be an independent um, person who can, can show up and be effective in a variety of different contexts. Um, the reality is when we talk about the 21st century, we really don't know what things are gonna look like. Even, I mean, I was having a conversation with a Cicero student today uh, and very much our, our learning today was mediated through ChatGBT. We have, and, and, and that has progressed just from when we were working with it in the spring. So we really, you know, to some extent we're flying blind. So skills like dealing with, with stress effectively are evergreen skills. And especially for our younger learners, when I say evergreen, what I mean is skills that aren't gonna go out of style, things that are going to serve you in your life, wherever you find yourself in whatever age you're at. And stress management is definitely a big one of those. How do you prepare for class? How do you ensure that you're, you're as you know, as you had said a moment ago, Jade, that you're ready to use that time to maximum effectiveness. Okay, I love this part. I'm a big far side fan. Um, so <clears throat> I would simply point out here, you know, the question I pose, which you can read that there. And if you you might want to check out the the sign there for the uh, the the school in the cartoon. My contention is, that, I see the smiles there, we got that. Um, my contention is that when we're looking at uh, how, you know, most learning uh, doesn't occur in, in, a, in a classroom, just to be clear, right? We're learning, we are learning machines constantly from the time we're born uh, until the time we stop moving. Uh, and yet the conversation around learning for the last 150 years or so has been very much centered in and around traditional brick and mortar schools, often public schools. And I would suggest to the group that those days are over. The, the, the world simply hasn't caught up yet. Um, and that's why it's so exciting to be part of a community like Cicero, because we, I think, are focused on the right skills at exactly the right time, which is today moving forward, um, hopefully with correct approaches and you are exactly the right people. All right. And I got a little bark of support there from my dog uh, teaching assistant so i apologize for that okay in in preparing for this and i like look I, I recognize here i've gone i'm zooming the group out here um i recognize that for many of you you might you know initially say okay great he's talking about some of the things that you know that i've struggled with or maybe i hadn't even thought of that but yeah that's a thing um and really focused on on the micro, like how can I be successful in my classes at Cicero? I wanted to zoom out. And so here I looked at, and the World Economic Forum is a, a group of world leaders representing most of the, the world's large economies. And you can see here, I'm not gonna read read these points verbatim, but they're, this is taken directly from uh, the World Economic Forum's website, looking at the work skills of tomorrow. And I'm sharing um, a, two or three more slides uh, 
that sums up their work, their, their summary. Uh, but I think that that first point is so telling um, that, you know, by their estimation, and they call it reskilling, that, you know, one in two employees, and, you know, arguably, if you are a student who is learning in an old school, pun intended that time, old, old school way of learning, um, you too will need reskilling and, and probably, in fact, already do. Um, so I'm going to take you through, a, if, hopefully I'll just give people a moment more uh, to take a look at that. But we're going to dig into each of these in the, the next few slides. Okay. So the World Economic Forum um, put together this list of what they consider to be the 10 work skills of tomorrow. And I would submit to you, these are also the 10 learning skills of tomorrow. In fact, if you, you know, manual labor, and in fact, in many ways, a lot of non-manual labor, I right, mentioned something like the AI, uh, is being taken off of our plates. So we are having to refocus and rethink about what does learning mean in the 21st century? What does work, in fact, mean? And, and what do I need to do to be successful in this, you know, unknown changing environment. Um, and I really want to impart to all of you, like to, to those of you that who are joining us today or joining us asynchronously, don't be afraid, be excited. This is an opportunity to do great things. Um, and, and I'm speaking from experience here. You know, recently I made the decision to go freelance and to work full time in this sort of, uh, this sort of manner. And I, I got to tell you, every day I wake up excited and energized for the opportunity to engage um, in this way um, and, and outside of the kind of old tired models that, that many of us are used to. And, I, you know, I hope I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here in the sense that you're at Cicero. So, you, you know, you must be feeling this as well. Just to explain the chart that is up here, um, there are the five skills that are on the left column are the actual skills. The little legend off to the right are the types of skills. And so you'll see there in this, for the first five of the 10, the next five I'll have in the next slide, um, are very much focused on problem solving, on critical thinking, um, on the ability to analyze and to be innovative. And even right there, if you stop and think for a moment, when we talk about a skill like being creative, and creativity is a skill. OK, yes, it may be a, a, an, an inherent aptitude or talent, something that some people are inherently have a, a creative mindset uh, in a way. If you think of any skill as being a spectrum, OK, very skilled, not very skilled. We all fall somewhere on that spectrum, right, for any of these skills. Creativity can be learned, practiced and taught. OK, innovation. Um, in fact, all of these things can be. Um, and certainly you're going to have aspects of these that really resonate with you, that you love, and others that 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 you don't. And so we just want to think about what are the minimum standards that we want to uh, accomplish as people so that we can show up. And if opportunities present themselves, opportunities for learning, opportunities for travel or, or for a job or for growth, that we feel like, oh, okay, I'm not going to have to go back and recertify or figure this out. No, I can hit the ground running and be confident that I can do these things. So critical thinking is, is definitely top of the stack there. Um, active learning and learning strategies, okay, which they put under self-management is, is our second. Um, problem solving as a related aspect of analytical thinking. Analytical thinking, obviously, there we're talking also about logic and reason. So some of the, you know, how to spot bias, um, how to look for errors in thinking. Um, and, and in particular here, I think that it is worth noting, I mentioned um, chat GBT and the AI, but even without the AI, um, it's, I, you know, and, and I'll ask for your, for your forgiveness if I'm saying something that's obvious, but it, I don't think it is because it should be, but we, we rarely talk about this. And, and it's this. And for the students here, um, you may not have the, the historical uh, time reference uh, to be able to appreciate this, but I, but Paul, I'm, I'm thinking that you and I cer certainly will, and it's this. When I go back to my time as a high school student, which, you know, and, and I'm admittedly a bit of an oldster at this point, but it's not really ancient history. We're talking about, you know, a little under three decades ago, I was a high school student uh, or in university, and 
I was going, I actually got my first email account midway through my undergraduate years in university. The web made its debut at that point. So here's the world that you didn't experience, um, speaking to the young people today. It's a world that moved slowly, where information was at a premium, where expertise, so like the idea of going into a room and, and hearing a lecture from a professor made sense because this legitimately could be someone who is giving, you know, opening a door to something that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Now, certainly, it's not that expertise doesn't have a role today. It does. But the reality is that we have gone from a world of information deficit to a, a world of information overload. And we have done that in a very short amount of time. So it's not so much memorization and, and rote learning, although there can be a role for each of those. No, instead, what we want to um, develop and practice and grow within ourselves is the ability to navigate and use information, to be able to tell the good from the bad, to be able to spot miss and disinformation. And, and certainly if you've been following the news this week, um, this has been one of the key aspects is that as world events are happening, people have basic questions about what is real and what is made up. Um, so this is part and parcel of the work of being a student today. Um, and particularly if um, you are very much guiding your own learning um, is how to trust information and where to find it. Obviously I'd mentioned creativity, originality and initiative, okay. And then moving into our next five. Okay. We can see now we get into a bit more diversified skill set. So in terms of, and you know, only one here is working with people. I'm not so sure about that, but like I say, this is this list is from the World Economic Forum. I think that that people skills um, are irreplaceable. Um, you know, perhaps none of these skills have been ranked or you know uh, sized up or down. But the ability to have social influence and to interact and communicate with others is huge. And on a related note, we also want to be able to lead. Lead means being able to work within our own lives with independence and autonomy, but also good leaders know when to ask for support, right? So we can speak to some of those skills as well. Then we have two, two sets of skills around technology, both the use and monitoring and control of technology, and how many people have been in a meeting or in a classroom where this has happened. The conversation is happening, and it might be actually, it's more like down here, so this is my, you know, the phone's down, it's like, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, right? Um, when time is precious, if you only have an hour or two working intensively with another human or maybe in a pod, I know this is new to, to Cicero, on a weekly basis, we want to make sure that we can use the tools instead of the tools using us. So being aware of the benefits and the drawbacks, okay? And that is both in the design technologies themselves, but also having some self-understanding about who we are as people. Um, some people find focusing and staying off of their devices quite e easy. Other people will need to build in a structure of supports, some of which might be electronic, in order to build a siloed focus so that they aren't distracted and being brought into other conversations when they're meant to be learning. This, the third area here, technology design and programming, this truly is the future and, and a bit out of my frame of reference because I am not a designer or a programmer, not by any stretch, but there is that. Um, but the last two, definitely more in my wheelhouse. The second last, um, resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility. I cannot stress enough how important this is, um, particularly when you are learning um, when I say learning individually or independently, I should say, just say learning, because the reality is a coercive, and I recognize we have different ages of learners here, so I apologize to some of our older ones if I'm breaking down the language, but co coercion or coercive just means when you're doing something because you, you're being told you must do it, like there's a penalty. So like, I have to do my homework, otherwise I will get a lousy grade. Okay, that's, that's coercive, meaning that the you know, doing it is coming from outside, okay? It's extrinsic, it's not inside of you, as opposed to intrinsic or inside motivation where you're like, I'm doing this because I love it, because I because this is something I wanna master. Well, 
this is related to, from my perspective, to resilience because resilience is a muscle that we can exercise and grow over time. Resilience is not giving up when we face challenges. It is um, being able to learn from our mistakes and actually seeing, and here's, here's from my perspective, and again, this seminar is not, or this workshop is not about um, you know, taking cheat shots at, at schools, not at our traditional learning, not at all. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, when we try to eliminate errors or pretend that failure, in fact, repeated failure, isn't inherent to our process of learning as humans, we're doing a disservice to ourselves, okay? We learn by trying, by failing, and then getting up and trying again and reflecting and, you know, again, improving, and constantly learning, there's this turnover that happens. And here's the thing, from my perspective, resilience is a skill that anyone can master. It really comes down to not giving up. Many people stop simply because they figure, I can't do this, this is beyond me. We can talk about how to move past that mindset and into something that's gonna serve you better. And then finally, and this one feels like um, a, a little bit repetitive from before, but reasoning and problem solving, ideation mean coming up with new ideas. So I'll just pause there. Uh, any any questions, any comments there from, from anyone live before we move into our next section? I'd love to hear a little more about the resilience mindset. How does mm -hmm. one, I, I love this idea that anyone can do it because when you're feeling not resilient, i.e. Mm -hmm. defeated, it feels like you definitely can't do it. Um, so how does one like build that muscle? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I think um, the, the shortest answer I have is mindfulness, um, but that doesn't really tell us much. What what I mean by that when I say mindfulness, it's, it's a deep and consistent investigation into what makes us tick as humans. And so, I, you know, my own perception is that um, I'm going to use a, a an analogy that that hopefully this will be closer to home for for teen teenagers in particular uh, or or preteens. When I think back to being a younger person and and dating, um, you know, what is the great fear of dating? Rejection, right? And so often, what what happens? You know, someone might might take a shine and someone's like, hey, I, I'd like to ask that person to hang out or whatever. And instead they don't, right? They're, they're way too afraid of rejection. And I certainly have observed this, you know, personally over the last couple of years with people um, sometimes often having their relationships only mediated through screens and perhaps a little bit less comfortable with face-to-face -face interaction, really reluctant to do that. Um, what we can, can do to build resilience skills first and foremost would be understanding our own capacity for positive versus negative self-talk. So most of us, most of the time are engaged in an inner dialogue. And I don't mean this like crazy instead, just like thoughts and feelings going around and around in our heads. Um, and that narrator often tells us, you know, because that narr narrator really wants to protect us. Okay. At the end of the day, um, it's our nervous system, our mind and our body trying to keep us safe. So rather than deal with the discomfort of rejection or failure, it's easier to essentially do what mammals do when they're threatened, either fight <laughs> or flight. Okay. Run away. And so resilience says, don't run, lean in, look for the discomfort and in a way that is supported, deal with it progressively being comfortable in the discomfort and then engaging in positive self-talk. I can do this. Um, I know I can do this. Um, I mean, those are two just right off the top of my head, but there are a whole suite of skills that we can build here to get better at this. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on this one. Yeah. Great question. Any, anything Jade, uh, Ness, we, we good to move on. We're good to move on. Thank you. All right. Good stuff. Okay. okay. Uh, so let's go here. Take a moment and maybe think about this. Two questions for you. Okay. And I should say here at Ness, I'm going to scale it down a little bit. If you're 11, let's make it the, the six-year-old version of you. Okay. Um, 10 might be a little bit too recent, but what advice would you give to a younger version of yourself? 
Okay. You learned, you've got experience now. If you were to be able to, you know, jump in a time machine and speak to yourself earlier and say, you know, don't worry about it. You know, the thing, the challenges that, that you perceive or the stresses that you have aren't in fact going to be perhaps the ones that really, you know, that you found challenging. Um, you know, what are those things? So what are the things that you've learned? Secondly, you might think about if you could speak to an, uh, a more senior version of yourself, what advice would you want? What insights would you hope to get? And so the, the chart that I've, I put here on the right um, is from the work of uh, Abraham Maslow. And I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of familiarity, uh, at, at least and you've seen that before, Jade? Yeah, I took um, eight psychology classes. I'm very familiar with that. Um, and then I think Ed, you took some kind of psychology course and you already know this too. Yeah, talk about it all the time. Right, and so you find it a useful model, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, like there are debates here about whether, you know, either from Maslow's perspective um, as a theorist or, or from the many, many people who have used his models, um, you know, moving forward from, from his work, whether uh, in a strict way we must move through the hierarchy from the kind of basic needs at the bottom up to um, the self-actualization needs or like the things that really like, you know, having a purpose in life and, and feeling like you're, you know, you're living your best life, whether those things have to be you move up and you must necessarily have all aspects all the way up or whether these are things that you can work on simultaneously, but certainly there's no denying um, that having a clear um, vantage point for what are my goals for the future? Where at least do I think I might be heading? And then what are my needs now? So that you can begin to have that conversation. And that right here, I'm kind of alluding to um, that resilience piece that, that you were asking about, Paul, in the sense that once you start reflecting and engaging in that, you know, learning from the past and planning and predicting for the future, um, you're going to be far better set up for success moving forward. Okay. In terms of, of solving problems, look, this is just one heuristic or this is just one model um, for how to solve a problem. But I, I actually included it just to identify what at least in my experience has often been the case, which is the skills, the learning skills, which are most important are rarely taught. So if you've had a, like a, a school report card, often there are like, you know, subjects and grades. Um, you know, I, I take history and science and Latin and, and what have you, and here are the grade markers for it. Um, and then often, and again, depending on where you're learning or what school, there are often a, a series of learning skills, sometimes called the soft skills, um, that uh, deal with exactly the things that we've talked about already, the ability to collaborate, to learn independently, uh, to be self-disciplined and so on, um, to, to have initiative and be a self-starter. Um, like those skills, problem solving is one that we expect people to do. And so this, again, I'm not gonna just read them out, but you can see this has laid out one very clear and very simple model for how to solve problems. Um, but very rarely do we actually dig into the actual sort of core skills. And so that is something, like I say, whether whether it is how to manage your schedule or how to stay motivated or how to solve a problem, we can talk about this and we can dig in. Okay. So critical thinking, since that is so much of what, um, what, what underlies, I would say, these skills, it's a big, big topic. So really here, providing an overview um, and just highlighting aspects that you might see as being important and want to touch back on in the, the next two workshops, whether that is more generally or um, in, a, in a particular context. Like, I guess what I'm suggesting there for all of you is this doesn't have to be theoretical. What do you find challenging in your life now <laughs> today right and and we can work with that okay so critical thinking skills include the ability to ask questions and there are there's a variety of different ways and and asking good questions being able to cut to the heart of the matter again is a skill that can be taught and learned um 
I actually learned this in a very personal way earlier this summer. I had, I had alluded to just as we were getting started today that I was interviewing a, a military commander, which is going to sound way out in left field for, for someone who's teaching history and, and wellness and executive function skills. But um, it's part of actually my work, historical work, I work as a historian, is I've been interviewing these different people. And what did I find out on day one of that process? I know lots about teaching and I knew this much about interviewing people, very little. I, I had to, even though I'm familiar with different ways of asking questions, it was context specific. So again, this is something that we can develop. The way that you question in a, in a discipline like chemistry might be very, very different from your investigations in ELA, to take one, one example. Using logic and reason. Um, this year in, in my uh, academic classes in Cicero, we're using, uh, actually, each and every class, we're um, investigating one key um, logic or reasoning skill, and specifically a series of fallacies and logic errors that people typically make. Um, so one, I'll give you one just off the top of my head, a common one is confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is one that we want to be really you know, aware of as students working in Cicero. And that is our tendency to, um, to look for sources of information that confirm our existing worldview. And there's a lot of scientific, this isn't theoretical anymore, there's a lot of brain-based scientific research that has um, been peer reviewed and come to the fore over the last 20 years that show very clearly what the traps are and how to avoid them. Okay, moving on. The ability to consider new perspectives. And again, so key, we, we live in a diverse world, a globalized world that is changing rapidly. The ability to empathize, to, um, to see things, to see take a problem and to be able to consider it from multiple vantage points, to be able to put yourself in another person's shoes. Key to learning in the future. Creativity we spoke to. And I also mentioned, you know, the, the peril of mis and disinformation and really just the, the whole issue of information pollution as well. The fact that there's an overwhelming, a fire hose of nonsense is actually how I sometimes uh, characterize the internet, you know, with a, a sprinkling of real value there. So it's like, we don't want to just turn off the hose. We want to learn how to take the good and leave the bad, or at least not useful. We want to talk about how to set goals and plan to meet them. And there, you know, a model that I have found really, really useful in working with young people is to set objectives. Like, in other words, to have clear, concrete goals that are time bound. OK, so in other words, we have a, a time frame that we want to accomplish them in and that we're actually actively looking at our time frame as we move through it so that we can adjust and strategize and you know, shift our tactics if things are working either really well or not so well. The second aspect that, that I think gets missed and it, it speaks to these skills is process. And so there, sometimes I, you know, I often will point out to, to the people with whom I'm working, is accomplishing our goals important? Well, of course it is. But it's not the only way of evaluating whether learning has been successful. Process matters. We want to be able to trust the process. And so this means setting an intention and then being able to evaluate how we are progressing as individuals as we move toward that goal. Okay. The ability to strategize effectively. So looking at long-term uh, strategies for the goals that we want to meet. Um, reflection is key. It is... Um, we we're talking about resilience and, and the sort of stress management skills. Reflection is the ground floor of that and, and really an important basis of learning and learning independently. Responsibility and getting support. Um, again, I think that responsibility takes practice. And what's brilliant about uh, working with Cicero and learning in the way that you all are is that you are being given the sort of responsibility that, that to my way of thinking, young people world over should be given. We know you can, I know you can handle it because I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it experientially in working with uh, students through Cicero. Um, but really here, again, this is a, a in part a mindset, um, you know, that will come with maturity, but also with practice. The other part of it is we recognize that learning and doing anything that matters often takes support. 
the idea of a, a self-made person, like I'm a self-made person, I pulled myself up my, by my bootstraps and did it all myself. Okay, maybe. And certainly there are people that are like exemplary and can do that. But, you know, very few things are done without the support of others. It's about how do we leverage the expertise and the supports that we have to be as successful as we can. Okay. So in terms of um, the, the various skills that we're talking about, and I recognizing we're moving into the last few slides, the last few minutes of this setup, and really here, like I say, I'm hoping that you're, you're coming away with um, perhaps not specific skills like saying, okay, now I know how to do this and I know how to do that. That's coming next week, same time, same channel for sure. But becoming aware, um, you know, the, the beginning of, of learning is knowing what you don't know. <laughs> you know, what are the, the, there's the known unknowns and then there's the unknown unknowns. Like you don't even know that it's a thing. So these are our core skills um, that we want to be able to do. And like I say, it's difficult to learn if you're hungry, if you're angry. Um, so being able to manage your emotions, um, being able to deal with motivation and to work in a mindset that's going to allow you to make the most of the time that you have. Okay. And then, uh, yes. Okay. Calvin and Hobbes. So I'll give you a moment there just to read that over. <laughs> so now I love Calvin. He's got the the ego, uh, the you know the the self interest of of uh, uh, well, not just a younger mindset, but this is this is many of us much of the time. Um, there's lots to learn. I think that humility really is our friend when we're learning, which is to say, and being able to admit I don't know that, or you know what, I could use some help, or I could use some practice on that. So last here in terms of this last area, so we had we had talked about some of the effective skills, the mindfulness and the self-inquiry. We had obviously started with the analytical skills, the thinking skills. We can talk about communication, how to do it well, how to listen actively, and, and in particular in the environment that we're in, in online classrooms. How do you make the most of working with attention, which is necessarily limited um, so that you can actually take the most of what's on offer. How do you self-regulate? When I talk about self-regulation, and this is a big part of learning, but also of those resilient skills, is how do you, if we wanna think about your body as being in balance, okay? When we move into, we can think of two extremes. So if you're ready, okay, you are gonna be a balance between aware on the one hand and relaxed on the other, okay? And your nervous system roughly reflects this. When we are stressed, we jump into our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight nervous system. And that basically kicks off a whole array of um, uh, chemicals in our body and nerve impulses that basically get us ready to, as I say, to fight, flight, or, or flee. And the other aspect of this would be parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest system when we're, we're chilling out and, and all as well. And what we want to be able to do is to find a balance between those two extremes, which is the sweet spot for working with others and for feeling good. And if we're feeling good, we're ready to learn. So practicing self-care is a big part of that. There are a host of easy, accessible skills, habits um, that you can use in order to be an effective, your maximally effective learner. Um, I am a big proponent here of, um, you know, the the kind of, you know, fly or die, or we're just gonna like, you know, pedal to the metal and go, 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 and, you know, look what I can accomplish. We live in a society where often people are encouraged to and rewarded for saying, oh, look at how busy I am. You know, look at all these things that I've got going on. Um, and really, you know, I think that not that we don't want to work hard, not that we don't want to accomplish a lot, but practicing self-care, slowing down, being deliberate is a hugely important skill. Okay. Making good decisions, obviously important, particularly given the in independence that you all have. Our ability to oh. main, main focus is a key one. 
Um, was was there a, a sorry? I was jumping between screen screens. I heard a little yelp there of identification. I think was that was that you, Ness? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, not not at all. <laughs> case in point. Case in point. Did you want to jump in? No, sorry. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, our ability to demonstrate empathy, including compassion for ourselves, our ability to resolve conflicts. And, and this is key, particularly in this environment, to maintain healthy boundaries. How do we say, actually, this is enough and this is too much, or I'm comfortable doing this, but actually, with respect to this, maybe less so. And then finally, how do we come up with a moral compass? How, we just, how do we decide to act ethically? And that includes in the process of our learning. So as we move toward next week, and I'm coming right in on time, your time is valuable, so I'm right to the moment here. Um, before we sign off, about uh, next Thursday's session, two questions for you. If you have any, what your, your current wor workflow is, your current approach to organization and time management, maybe jotting a few notes about, think about, about it this way. Imagine, uh, what I like here is to think about, if you were gonna describe your way of learning today to a grandparent who almost certainly was not in a virtual classroom when they were learning uh, in school. How would you describe your workflow, your approach to being an org organized and managing your time and getting stuff done? And then secondly, what challenges have you had and what are you current, you know, maybe facing in the future? Okay. And that share them with me in Slack or bring them into the next session. Um, I'm pleased to be able to share that we will have two special student presenters, one of whom is uh, with us today, Jade, um, and I'll I'll be book ended by them, and we're going to get into um, the real nuts and bolts of how to do this work. But like I say, whether you're with us live or or whether you're you're watching the recording and joining us um, after the fact, to the extent that we hear from you allows us to more directly speak to your concerns with respect to the challenges you're facing. So with that said, I'm going to leave it there and thank you all for, for watching. Hope that this was useful. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Be well, and, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Michael. That was great. Yeah. Awesome. Really good. Fantastic. Good to see you. Great. Well, I'm really looking forward to digging into, like I say, the, uh, to hear, to hearing from, from Cleo and from you, Jade and, uh, digging into some of this, the really getting into the weeds next week. So 